Lincoln Park, at the time of Chester Bennington's death, had been a band for 21 years. And even though Chester's death was a major blow to the band, and they have been without a replacement vocalist, they have been active with band business. And even within the last couple years, they have released and dropped previously unreleased tracks, including special edition albums and demo tracks. So for a band that technically should probably be defunct, they are very active and keeping the band alive. This video is kicking off a series similar to our Sum 41 discography tour that we released, where we will visit the band's history and go through each of their studio albums in depth. So make sure you join us here each week as we dive into a band that defined a generation of young people. Also, each week we also go live right here on YouTube where we talk about the video and everything music, and it's, it's always a lot of fun. So sit back and enjoy, and if you like this video, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, do all the things. It helps the, the channel and the community grow. So now, without further ado, let's get into the beginnings of Linkin Park. So, where did Linkin Park get started? Well, it all started in Agora High School, just outside of Los Angeles, in Agora Hills, California, where three friends, Mike Shinoda, Rob Borden, and Brad Delson, started a band. Now, initially, the name of the band was Super Zero, and Zero was spelled with an X. And as time went on, eventually they did just drop the Super and just call themselves Zero, but still spelled with that X. And to record their music, Mike Shinoda had actually set up a makeshift studio in his bedroom, and the seriousness, the seriousness of the band went full force once they graduated high school, which at that point they met some new friends and they recruited Joe Hahn, uh, who ended up being the DJ, Dave Farrell, and Mark Wakefield, who was the original vocalist that they hired for the band. Now, as the band went on and they, they started recording demos, they started performing live, they started contacting a whole bunch of different A&R guys, different record companies. Nobody had any interest in the band Zero. None. They had such a hard time trying to get any of these record companies behind them that they, they started to become discouraged. So eventually, from that lack of success and prospects, Mark Wakefield actually left the band in search of other prospects and other pursuits, which ultimately would be the monumental shift for the band that they needed. Because now they had to find a new vocalist. And what singer do they come across? Enter Chester Bennington. The band didn't know Chester and they had no previous knowledge of him whatsoever. But by pure happenstance, they found him because they had contact with a guy by the name of Jeff Blue, who just so happened to be the vice president of a record company by the name of Zomba. Now, he was a fan of the band and he was a heavy supporter. He really believed in what they were doing. So what he recommended was that they contact Chester Bennington because his, uh, his Chester's previous band, Great Days, had actually fallen through. Um, it wasn't seeing the success that Chester had hoped. So he had left that band. Now, Great Days, they definitely deserve a video all on their own. And hopefully at some point, uh, we'll be able to take the time uh, to visit that band um, in, in a video and, and just go through some of their music. Because if you haven't heard them, Ever, you're missing out because Chester's vocals have always been so strong and even still uh, before Linkin Park when he was in Grey Days the, it was still the case he had such amazing vocals so if you haven't listened to Grey Days you definitely should go check them out so at the recommendation of Jeff Blue the band sent Chester some of their demos for him to do whatever he saw fit with them so he took some time he rewrote some of the lyrics wrote his own parts and then he recorded his own demos um, with his vocals over the tracks and then he sent them back to the band and this was the turning point for the band This is what they needed Chester Bennington was the missing ingredient to make the band what they needed to be So after Chester was welcomed into the band in 1999 they changed their name again uh, This time to hybrid theory which fans will recognize that name because it is the name of their first studio album that they released now, even though Chester joining the band would make a difference for their success overall, um, initially they still had a lot of rejections, well over 50 rejections. They still sent out their demos and they, they kept trying to contact different record companies to see if somebody would have any interest, but nobody had any interest whatsoever in the band. So they started working on new material and they found a temporary replacement for Dave Farrell, who at the time had left to go on tour with a Christian ska band called Tasty Snacks while the band was figuring everything out. So in his place, they hired a guy by the name of Kyle Christner on the bass, who would actually end up leaving before they would record their first studio album, Hybrid Theory. So when they did end up eventually recording, they actually had two different bass players, um, one by the name of Ian Hornbeck and one uh, 
Scott Koziol. Uh, together, they did the bass parts for that first album. But before all this happened, the band recorded a self-titled EP and they played over 50 showcases, but they still had no offers, not even any interest in the band. Even after utilizing the internet by having one of the earliest known street teams where fans promoted their music through all different kinds of websites and chat rooms, they still could not find any success. So being at a loss for what to do, they contacted Jeff Blue once again for some advice. But at this point, he was no longer with Zumba anymore. He had moved on to Warner Brothers, where he had taken the place of vice president. This was their foot in the door, because with Jeff's influence, the band was able to sign a record deal with Warner Brothers as a developing artist. And it was at that point that they decided to finally change their name from Hybrid Theory to Linkin Park. Now, the reason they decided to change their name was actually to avoid confusion and legal issues with a Welsh band who was also on the Warner Brothers label of the same with the same name. They were also called Hybrid Theory. Now, after they decided to change their name, there were a few ideas thrown around and none of them seemed to stick. But Chester recommended the idea of Lincoln Park because he was driving by a Lincoln Park um, in Santa Monica, which to their thinking would have a widespread appeal because most communities within the United States would have a park, a community, some place that probably would have been named after Abraham Lincoln. So they felt that it was a relatable name. Now, Linkin Park was a band that really tried to use the internet to their advantage. And in 1999, this was a new idea. So as a part of that vision, one of the things that they did was they intentionally misspelled Lincoln. So instead of spelling it like Abraham Lincoln's name, they spelled it L-I-N-K-I-N because they were able to grab a hold of the domain name LinkinPark.com if they spelled it that way. Even though this was a great way to have their foot in the door, the challenges came when the A&R guy started the process of developing them. One of the biggest battles surrounded Mike Shinoda and his rapping. The label was adamant that he shouldn't do any rapping and should only play the keyboards. Now, the band being the band that they were, they had a very clear vision of what they wanted to see come from their band and what they wanted to be. So they stuck to their guns, they backed up Mike Shinoda and insisted that he keep being able to rap on the music. The label even tried to fight Dirty by taking Chester aside and telling him that he needed to influence the band to stop the rapping and fire Mike Shinoda. But Chester, being a good bandmate, stood by his band and basically told the label to go screw themselves. <laughs> um, a more lighthearted story about the label trying to change the band revolved around a gimmick idea for DJ Joe Hahn. Now, Warner Brothers recommended that maybe Joe should wear a lab coat and a cowboy hat while performing, and they could refer to him as the doctor. It, it's amazing to me that the label was so wrong on how to market these guys, but Linkin Park knew what Linkin Park should be. So the band stood by their decisions, and they stood firm in what they wanted to do. And it ended up paying off, being one of the biggest bands of the early 2000s. Now, when it came time to record their album, now that they're with Warner Brothers, they're able to record an album, they fought the label a little bit for creative control. It will not fight him for creative control. Now it came time to record, and they got stuck with a record producer by the name of Don Gilmore. Now, he really ended up being a major pain in the butt. He was very pushy in the studio, and regularly insisted on rewrites and lyrical revisions. And it frustrated Chester so much that when he was recording his vocals for the song One Step Closer and he got to the part where he screams, shut up, multiple times in the song, Chester's screaming was actually directed straight at Don. He was just that frustrated at this point. But with all this push, it actually only took them four weeks to record their debut album, Hybrid Theory, which some of it was reworked songs from their, their previous Hybrid Theory EP, so they did have a bit of a head start, but a lot of it was also new material as well. After the recording was complete, the album was released on October 24th of 2000, and then Linkin Park, over the next year, would play over 300 shows. That's right, over 300 shows. Like, that's insane. And all of this hard work that they put in would pay off, because Hybrid Theory ended up being a hit record, and it was the number one selling album of 2001. So approximately after five years of trying to get signed and being rejected and trying and being rejected, their hard work led them to be one of the biggest bands at the turn of the century, and there's still so much more to come when we talk about the release of their second and their third album. Now, there is a lot more to be talked about, but we'll get into more of that next week, in addition to talking about the first album, Hybrid Theory, in depth. 
Now, if you like this video, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, do all the things. It really helps the channel and the community to grow. And don't forget to join us for our live stream this week. Um, we hope to see you there, and we will see you here next week um, as we dive into the next section of the Linkin Park series as we talk about their debut album, Hybrid Theory. Thanks for joining us.